right. Hey guys, how's everybody doing this evening? My name is John. We have the I have the privilege of leading our Monday night Christ Center recovery meeting as well as uh, Greenhouse Project itself. Um, we meet every Monday night from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And anybody is welcome who is looking to be set free from their life dominating sin. And so if you know anybody that needs help, um, they can go to info, they can email info at ghproject.org, call us at 610-874-2753, or check out our website, it's ghproject.org. At Greenhouse, we cultivate lifelong disciples, leaders, and advocates, and uh, whose passion will be to reach the lost and transform local communities. As a result, we love to help people grow in difficult places. So uh, to find out these messages that we record or even our Sunday teaching or, or other videos, you can go to our website and there's a link to uh, our YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram that tends to have a lot of our events and everything. Uh, we are a donor-supported ministry, so we want to thank, always thank those who give and pray for us regularly. Uh, you can continue to give with us. There's an anonymous box here where you can go online. Uh, this meeting is live uh, and in person, uh, and, and we do record just the teaching side of it and then turn it off for the sharing side to, for each person's anonymity. Uh, i like to pray, and then we'll read the full serenity prayer, which is on page 1672 if you follow the recovery Bible. So, Father God, we thank you and worship you and praise you. God, I'm just grateful for who you are, Lord, and... Man, as a result of being saved, of, of you laying down your life and purchasing my sin, God, as a, as a result of that supernatural love and, and the grace you've given us, I'm just grateful, Lord. I'm not here today because I need anything else from you. You're not a magic genie in the sky, but you're my Lord and my Savior. And I understand I've been bought with the price, and I don't belong to myself anymore, Lord. I do pray for those that are still struggling and sick, and suffering, God, as, as I'm continuing to walk with you as well. So please, God, have your way in our hearts and our minds, and I pray that each one of us can be useful to you and your kingdom, that no longer do we have to live for ourselves and live for pleasures that never even please, Lord, but we can live for you. So thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Taking this world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you make all things right when I surrender to your will. So you may bring me joy in this life, and I'll be ultimately happy with you forever in the next. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, the first, welcome to December, everybody, if nobody's welcomed you to December yet. So the first uh, Monday in the month, uh, we like to highlight a step. And since it's December, guess what step we're working on? 12, because everybody here has the page. Uh, we're we're, we're going to hit a step a month, and you can actually go back uh, onto our YouTube channel and see teachings on every single step so far. Um, so step 12, and everybody has a paper we hand, hand it out, says having a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry these messages, this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. We're going to get into the discussion questions and then how to actually do this in a minute. I want to look at a different set of verses for today. And, um, you know, I don't know if I actually wrote in there. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 12. First chap 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. It's actually not on that paper. 1 Timothy 1. Verses 12 through 17. And it's an important place for us to be. It's a real important place for us to be. I mean, there's Bibles right there. You can grab in there. Or there's one up here. You can grab You can grab a little mini Old Testament, New Testament one. Um, it will help you out. I just like to read it and talk about it. We get into the Word today. 
First Timothy chapter one, starting in verse 12, says this. And I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. But I have obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of the Lord was exceeding, exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Jesus Christ. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners who I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me, first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king of eternal, immortal, invisible God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is how it reads in the New Living Translation. Just in case anyone was a little confused, here's a really simple he says, I thank Jesus Christ, my Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. That's what he means by he has enabled him. He has enabled me because he counted me faithful to the ministry. Paul is simply saying here is, I thank Jesus Christ, my Lord. I have gratitude for Christ. There's a real gratitude that comes in for Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about why in a minute. Who has given me strength to do his work. He's considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, not as a result of his own strength, but a result of the salvation in Jesus Christ. And, and, and Paul boasts on his weaknesses here. He's not highlighting his sin. He's not glorifying his sin. He's pointing back to the person who he used to be. He remembers. He says, even though I used to be a blasphemer, he blasphemed the name of Christ, in insolence, I persecuted God's people. He was the murderer. He, he literally murdered people uh, for the sake of the law. And he, he recognizes this. But God had mercy on me because I did it ignorantly and un, in unbelief. And he changed his tone here. He says, oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. Does anybody remember that every single day? How gracious God is? How much mercy he had on me? He said, he filled me with the faith and the love that comes with Jesus Christ. Here's why that's important. When we look at step 12, 12 it says, as, as a result of having a spiritual awakening. It means we're spiritually awake when it comes to step 12. And what Paul is, is lining up here is saying, listen, I lived a life in a former way. I know what it's like to look back at it. Some of, it is, some of us on these calls or, or here have been in recovery a short time. Some people have been in a long time. Some of us have done a lot of damage in our life. Some of us have done a little. But we can look back and look at the things that we used to do, right? Can everybody identify that? There's a past. We have a past that we used to operate in. And he's saying, there, there was a way that I used to be, but something happened and changed me. And this change actually pushed me into ministry where I can be useful to God and useful to other people. What happened? Well, Paul became spiritually woke all right if we want to use the term woke in this world he was spiritually awakened why that happens when someone's born again see coming to our step 12 it's not the last step all right it's actually the beginning step that pushes you back to the beginning of step one the steps don't end by the way the scriptures don't end there'll be no end to god's word it's going to go on forever jesus's words will never pass away as a result of being born again, being made new. Step one, when we get into it, uh, it means we're powerless over sin and our life has become unmanageable. Step two is I came to believe the power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. Step three, I gave my will over to the care of God. I no longer exist. I understand my own way to destroy my life. I no longer exist. God, I want everything in my life to be about you. Give me your will, God. And this is the basis for being born again. This is how, and the reason why, actually, the people that pen these steps designed it for, 
for people to be set free through the blood of Jesus Christ. Point blank. No matter what anybody says in any meeting, the truth is the only way to be set free is to develop a real relationship with God. We always say this. It, you can't kill the cobwebs. You need to kill what? The spider. The spider is addressing sin. And, and, and we get to our step 12. The writer realizes that, listen, as a result of me, me being spiritually born again, as a result of doing the work inside these steps, we're going to talk about that in a minute, these things birth something called gratitude. Gratitude is very, very important for anybody that walks in this world. I'm going to tell you why. Does anybody here get in a spot where you complain a lot? Everything stinks. Everybody stinks. Your work stinks. Your boss stinks. Your car stinks. Your spouse stinks. Your kids spink, stinks. Your pay stinks. Your TV stinks. Everything stinks. Oh, I'm the only one that complains. Okay. We all have gotten to a spot where we can get into a spot of constantly complaining and look at the things that are negative. Instead of realizing this, you know what the scriptures say? Those that are forgiven much, love much. We want to be able to love. We, we have to understand every day, or sometimes every moment of every day when we wake up, that we've been given the greatest gift. If you're in recovery and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been set free from the power of sin and death, you have the greatest gift ever. And you've been forgiven much. And the cause of being forgiven much should be much love. And this is what that means. Every morning I get to wake up, I get to be grateful for what I have. I don't look at what I don't have. I don't even look at things I need anymore. I need to be, uh, God wants me to be grateful for what he has given me already, eternal life. I said in the beginning, some of us treat God as, he, as if he's a magic genie in the sky and he's just here to be our slot machine. God, I need a new car. I need a new girlfriend. Like everything needs a, two, a, new, a new 2.0 for me to have a better life. And that's just not true. We're going to talk about happiness versus joy in a little bit. He says, those that are forgiven much, love much. And as a result of these steps, as a result of being spiritually awakened, we, we understand that should give birth to gratitude. Literally, good people don't go to heaven. It's forgiven people. When we know we've been forgiven from our sins, set free from the power of sin and death, what, what should be the next desire is to see other people forgiven. Those that are Forgiven much, love much. As a result of practicing these steps. Now, I would never highlight the steps on the level of the Word of God. They come out of the Word of God. There's a biblical truth behind each one of these steps. But the results of working the scriptures, there's a scripture behind each step. They didn't write the step. They took scriptures. By the way, they, 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 they almost called AA the James Club. Because a lot of the scriptures they pulled come out of the book of James. As a result of these steps, meaning as a result of what God does to a life that becomes abandoned to him. We forget that the root of addiction is selfishness and self-centeredness. It's all about me. It's all about how I want and how I feel. And we have to understand that's not just an alcohol and drug addiction. That comes out in pride. It comes out in greed. It comes out in so many different ways that I highlight my own wants and needs over the wants and needs of other people or even the wants and needs of God. That's why the steps literally say, gave my will over to the care of God. And we talk about it a lot. Have you ever given your will to someone? Yeah, it's like incredibly hard to do. You're like, here's my will. Uh, I want to go out to eat in five minutes, you know? <laughs> and like, you're, like, you're like, here's my will. I'm going to take it right back. As a result of these steps, as a result of actually working the biblical principles behind these steps, there's a spiritual awakening. And you know what the result of that is? We need to tell people. I don't know about you, but we carry the message to other people. Now, I know for a fact, when I came out of prison, I, had, I tested positive for hepatitis C. And, and, and I just got saved, and I came in. I wanted to tell everybody for how Jesus Christ set me free from, from, from the power of sin. I, I just needed to tell everybody. I'm so grateful that I just wanted to tell everybody, and I still have that mindset. But I remember I tested positive for hepatitis C, and I remember going to the doctor, and uh, the doctor gave me another test for hepatitis, and it was gone. There was people that literally prayed over me that I would be delivered from hepatitis C, and guess what? I actually did. I had it one day, and I didn't have it anymore. 
I told everybody about that. If your life has really been spiritually renewed, if you have really been changed, wouldn't you want to go tell everybody? Wouldn't you want to go tell everybody that, that I had a sickness leading unto death? And guess what? It's not there anymore. You'd want to tell everybody. You'd want to take these principles and practice them in every ounce of our affairs. This is what some people miss when they work the secular view of steps. It's not just for drug and alcohol addiction. Practicing principles, the biblical principles in all our affairs, has to do with everything personal, everything business, everything in my mind, everything with integrity, everything with right standing. It means I'm not going to cheat on my taxes. You shouldn't be working under the table. You should be doing things the right way. It means I shouldn't be lying or cheating. I shouldn't be blowing stop signs. And, 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 and I should allow the spiritual steps, the, 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 the scriptures, to literally change every ounce of my life. Everything. And guess what? In the areas where I fall weak or I fall short, the Holy Spirit should convict me back into truth. He's gentle and kind in his conviction. He, he's gentle. He wants us to be led back in the truth. But as a result of being spiritually transformed, as a result of walking with God, of actually working the, the, the steps and living out the Word of God, it should transform every ounce of my being. Why is this important? Because the proof of step 12 isn't reading some work and writing in a book. The proof is always going to be how we live our life, the evidence of what comes out. It's always going to be the evidence of how we live out our life. When something really impacts my life, you can't stop telling about it. And there's a few times in Scripture where Jesus went through and literally healed everyone in the whole village. There was a time there's a blind man in, in Mark chapter 10 who's literally on the side of the road crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody's like, buddy, be quiet. Just go back on the side of the road. And it made him yell even more. He had this desire to seek God out. There were times Jesus healed people and he said, no, don't tell anyone. How could you not? My life's been impacted by heaven here on earth. And I want to go tell everyone. I want to go help other people. When we reach the fullness of being set free, it should cause you to see other people still suffering and saying, you know what? I can help. Once, a lot of us lived a lifestyle where we were helpful to no one. <laughs> we weren't really helpful to anyone walking or living in addiction or even walking in sin. But we're called by God as a result of the steps to go out and to seek other people. It's not a new concept. It's always been around, including in the Old Testament. The Jews, Israel, was supposed to be a city on the hill. They were supposed to be a light to all nations. They did things so differently that they were supposed to stand out. They weren't supposed to set up their own club that excluded everybody. They were supposed to be a light to the world. After Jesus' disciples become radically transformed, Jesus rises from the dead. The last thing he tells them before Pentecost come is the Great Commission. The 11 disciples went into Galilee to a mountain which Jesus had appointed to them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus literally has all authority. He said, As we're told, he said, Go, therefore, Make disciples of all nations. That word disciple, we can look at it as spiritually parenting one another. It, it, it's someone being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It's just like having my son come around or an apprentice that's witnessing everything you do, and then they do it as well. In the rooms, you know what they call this? Sponsorship. We call it mentorship, spiritual guides. Sometimes it's pastored and shepherding. The basic word is disciple. Come and be my apprentice. That's what the 12 disciples were. They lived and ate and lived with Jesus day in and day out. They became like him. They saw what he did. They witnessed it. They wanted to live like him. And guess what? Jesus died and rose again. You know what he does? He leaves. Then he sends the Holy Spirit. 
to be the indwelling. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit becomes the guide, the counselor for everything else. The Spirit has a purpose, by the way, to testify of the Son and to be the convictor of sin. He's the truth. He's, he's the built-in lie detector. He's supposed to testify the Son and convict the world of sin. And Jesus said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. He's saying, as a result of your life being transformed, you now have a responsibility. It's not so you go sit back in your room, go sit in a room all day, every day, and watch TV. The result is go out and do this with other people into all nations and the highways and byways. And by the way, it's a discussion for another time. It doesn't mean you're being called to go to Africa and you're being called, called to go to India. You might be, but this starts where? In your home, with your neighbors and the people that you work with, and the people that you come in contact with, go. You know what he tells them? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach people about Jesus. Tell them about the good news of how you've been set free. Reach out to the person that's still struggling with alcohol and drug addiction and tell them about the freedom. If we live in a world that we're just complaining about our own sin and being a drug addict or a junkie all day, every day, and never pointing to his freedom— what good is life? Why would I wake up and complain every day? Paul says, I desire to know nothing of you other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. And sometimes it becomes tiring sitting around people that just complain and cry about how horrible things are. Listen, I get it. It's Life's rough for a lot of us. But you know what we do? We point to Jesus. We look at Jesus. We look at the promises of Scripture. We look at what it's like to walk in his truth and his righteousness. And he says, when you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you know what the next thing? Teach them to obey all things I've commanded you. You know this is the essence of the 12th step? Is taking this back to other people. Seeing that there's other people still sick and suffering that, that are struggling in drug addiction, maybe pornography, whatever it is, food, money. You can go through a list of active sin people are living in and say, no, there's freedom. There's real freedom for you, and I can tell you about it. And guess what? I believe this 12, the 12 steps are the most simple discipleship tool that we have. It addresses inner character. It talks about obedience. It talks about turning our will over to the care of God. You have to get saved when you go through it. He says, teach them all things I have commanded to you, and lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. I don't know about you. But I need to hear that today, that no matter what's going on, that no matter where you're at, someone might be walking in sin where you, you feel like you've lost your fellowship with God. Maybe you don't even have a real relationship with God and you're hurt and you're broke and you realize your life has been a mess. Today's the day you can start over. Today's the day that freedom can come and visit you to remember the first part of this step is a spiritual awakening. And it's the beginning of gratitude. The, the, the guy that discipled me when I was in prison taught me how to pray. And, and, and for years, when I would pray, I would always hit my knees. And I would remember the first time I'd pray is when I hit my knees in my bunk in jail. And my, and my celly would go out and I'd close the door. And now I chuckle to think that I had these big dreams and hopes in prison. You know what they were? I just didn't want to be a junkie and I just didn't want to be a criminal. That's all I wanted. I didn't pray for houses or cars or ministry or bank accounts. None of those things were even for all I wanted to do was be set free. It's all I knew. But that's a start. That's a beginning. By the way, you can't live there forever. It's a progression. We have to take a walk and we grow in our relationship. That's the first step, by the way. When we look back, step two is I gave my I uh, came to believe that the power of God can restore me to sanity. Step three, gave my will over to the care of God. Step four, five, six, and seven are all about addressing my character defects. Things on the inside. Char things that you can't see. Am I a liar? Do I have a lot of anger and fear? Do I manipulate? Am I a cheater? Those all things should be addressed on the inside and take steps time by time by time, day by day by day, to eventually you get to eight, nine, which is about make, making a plan to make amends to other people and then actually making amends to people. So what happens in those first nine steps is I reconciled unto God, 
reconciled unto myself, and I get reconciled unto other people. 10, 11, and 12 are maintenance steps. Not that I need to maintain the walk, but it's really a way to reconcile everything else in, in an immediate pattern. I'll tell you what. Step 10 says, I currently, I continue to take personal inventory when I'm wrong, promptly admit it. What he's saying is when the Holy Spirit moves in your life and convicts you of sin, confess it. Say, I did wrong. Sorry, I said something wrong there. I messed up. I can just own it right away. I can take care of it right then and there. It doesn't have to breed a resentment. It doesn't have to go any further than that. I can instantly take care of things that are wrong. Step 11 is all about seeking through prayer and meditation to prove my conscious contact with God. FYI, in the scriptures too, and according to the steps, the prayer is praying for God's will in my life. The prayer isn't God make me healthy, wealthy, and wise, although that's part of prayer. If you're sick, you need to be anointed. If you're challenging, you need to be aware. The prayer is, God, I want to know your will for me, and I want to do your will. Why? Because our will got us in the seats where we're at today. My will got me where I'm at today. And then we come to 12, where it says, having a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to other, it says alcoholics, but other people struggling with sin, and to practice these principles in all our affairs. This highlights spiritual renewal. There's a result of, uh, the, there, there's the idea of, of receiving a prize for, for, for the diligence of seeking God and putting in the hard work. The result is a life transformed. The result is being put into a position where now we can help other people. We get to seek out hurting people. We get to live by biblical principles. We get to constantly communicate with God and, and with, with other people through active sharing. We practice. We apply this. We're willing. We're open. There's a selflessness. There's a humility that comes, along, comes alongside this. I don't know where everybody's at right now in practicing your step work. Some people are still operating in step one. Some people have going through the steps over and over again. Some of you mentor other people and, and lead people. Um, but this is something that we can all practice regularly. The 12 steps, the 12th step is not the end of our journey. It's really just the beginning. Because sometimes I need to practice a recipe more than once. Did anybody here cook it all? Anybody try to make something and it came out so perfect the first time you never had to do it again? This is the hard thing about having people online. Um, not everybody gets my jokes, okay? So thank you for the no people that laughed on that one. Um, literally, you don't, it's not like you're going to do a recipe and it's going to come out perfect the first time. You need to practice these things and be refined. And I've learned, I've gained so much more insight into how I practice the steps on, through how I work that with other people. The goal is to be a lifetime student of, these, uh, of the scriptures, a lifetime student of what God is doing through these steps. And we get so much more when we give it away than the first time when we go through it. And I think it's like that with anybody that's practiced something for a long time. At some point, you come back to a spot, you're like, wow, I'm like a brand new student again. It's like I need to relearn everything. I have a new curiosity for what's going on. I get to learn so much more about me by studying and, and looking where we're, we're, we're to grow for, for the information. This entire journey is about submitting to Jesus Christ and him cru crucified, a new king on the throne, and the king isn't me. The entire process has been about lordship, the process of deep relationship with Jesus, and then helping lead other people to him. Not to me. I'm not the king. He's the king. You know what the result is of being spiritually renewed? We talk about a lot. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, self-control. There, there, there's these supernatural gifts. The, the, the fruit, it's singular. That's a result of the Holy Spirit moving in their life. And I don't know about you, but it's easy to love my wife when things are going well. It's hard to love my daughter when I'm trying to do work and she's one and she's biting my leg, okay? That's when I really need to have supernatural love. The reason why I'm saying that is because that didn't work out too well for me earlier. I got kind of frustrated through it. But then, you know, I have to depend on the spirit when those things happen. 
sharing our story of what we've done is incredibly quite simple, but incredibly powerful. You can change somebody's day in one second by, by saying, you know what? I've been where you've been, or I've seen where you are. And I want to tell you about the story of either me being set free or somebody else being set free. There's still hope. There's a lot of hope. You know what encouragement you can bring to somebody else's life of saying, I believe there's a greater purpose for you. I, I know it because I know God's word. I know there's something much bigger planned for you. There's freedom in your life. You don't have to be trapped by, by, by the addiction that you're in or even the sin that you're walking in. If you're not in a spot that you're grateful and you have gratitude, you're probably in a spot where you're complaining and you're pointing the finger at everyone else. This is why we all need those steps regularly to go back to, no, I'm my own problem. Kenny's not my problem. Richie's not my problem. Tony's not my problem. I'm my own problem. And the only way that gets reconciled is coming back to the cross. And somehow in this whole process of us being messes, good for nothing, homeless junkie that overdosed and died three times, at some point God is saying, you can be the most impactful tool to the people that you come, that you come around with. How about that? Someone that was at one point worthless and really good for nothing or, or maybe a useful tool can now be useful to God in his kingdom. We have to make sure we point people who are hopeless to the real hope that's always going to bring joy and a peace that surpasses all understanding. We make sure to highlight that God did what I couldn't do for myself. And this is what Paul does when we highlight it in Timothy. Paul isn't saying, look at what I've done. Paul is saying, you want to know what I did? I destroyed my life. I was a blasphemer. I was a murderer. I Look at all the things I did. And guess what? Look at what God did as a result of that. I can't claim anything that happened in my life as a result of me. I just point it back to that's a result of Jesus Christ and crucified. I can own the horrible things I've done. I can't blame it on anybody else. I did those things. But Jesus Christ brought me freedom, and the result is I want to tell everybody about it. And if we could just help one other person taste that freedom, be set free from sin, to be moved into a different place than where they were, then it's all worth it. Take a moment to recap your journey if this is you. If you've been through some stuff, remember it. Remember why. Write it down on a piece of paper. Share it with another person. We always talk to people in, in, in our church to say, what's your elevator speech? How can you share your testimony in 30 seconds or less? It's a pack, impactful tool. You're walking down the grocery store. Somebody says, hi. You know, somebody's always said, how are you doing? I'm like, man, I'm grateful. Jesus Christ took my penalty of sin upon myself. Hey, I was a homeless junkie and I died. and overdosed and died three times, but Jesus Christ set me free. Whatever your, your little elevator speech could be, it could be impactful to someone. It just could give hope to someone along the way. And especially those that have the greatest impact in, in the church or, or, or in AA t tends to be people that are in their first five years of sobriety. Why? Because they still know sick and hurting people. It's one of the reasons why we love urban ministry and we love addiction ministry, because we get to we get to see that people are still hurting, but we get to have a great impact because we get to walk side by side with people that need help. So uh, the assignment would be meet with your spiritual mentor and pray. It would be to write a one or two page summary uh, of, your, of your 12 steps, like a recap so you understand it for yourself. A short story would help too. To write out Matthew 28 that we just read, it's called the Great Commission. And then we would start to pray for other people to sow into, other people to, to disciple, you know, be part of a church that's going that way. And I would always say, put yourself in a spot where you can share with other people that are sick and suffering. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. God, we worship you today. You're so good, God. I'm just grateful that you would set me free. I'm a sinner, Lord. You would set me free from the power of sin and death. God, and I pray that we can just be useful to other people that are sick and suffering. God, I just don't want to look at my own challenges and problems. I want to look towards your glory. But God, also highlight in my heart the people that are around me that are still hurt and still in need. 
If each one of us looked at God and looked at other people, what would this world be like? I'm not a consumer. God, I'm not the victim. As a matter of fact, we've been your focus. The word says the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And as a result, you use us to impact a broken world. So we thank you for your freedom. We thank you for your grace. God, we thank you for your mercy. God, and I pray that we can remember gratitude every single morning, a short list, a short prayer of everything that you've given us. The greatest thing is reconciling our sin and a peace that surpasses all understanding. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.